BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned eighty eight on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder, every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer. But any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel. And let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. First, I would like to give a big thank you to everyone who listened to the episode on the Miami Strangler, which came out last weekend. Last week, actually. Not really the weekend, but it was for Friday. Friday is kind of the weekend, but also kind of a weekday paradox, right? So, that was one that was requested by McFarlane Books, actually, and I had a chance to talk to some people who worked there, as well as the writer himself, Michael P. Burns, who is the author of The Flat Tire Murders. And you guys left some really great comments about the Miami Strangler. And one more time, the name of his book is called The Flat Tire Murders, which talks about a lot of the unsolved crimes of South Florida. In addition to hosting Black Box Online Radio, I am also the host of the program Astro Psych 400, another channel here on YouTube. And on the weekends, I was hoping to do a segment called The Podcast for Sleep, where I would make something that would be customized to help people fall asleep at night. Some people were saying that they use this program, Black Box Online Radio, to fall asleep, and I was like, why not make something that is specifically designed for that? And that is available on Astro Psych 400. I was unable to get an episode out this weekend, last weekend rather, as well as doing a special segment on Black Box Online Radio, but that means that there will be more coming out this week. Yeah, I was just on the road and just some time constraints that prevented me from doing so, but I'm really hoping that I can make that a regular thing, as well as responding to some questions and comments that you guys have. Sometimes it wouldn't be enough for an entire episode, but maybe doing something very small on the weekend, responding to just a few of your questions and comments, whether it's about the Zodiac Killer or about Jean Benet Ramsey or about the Long Island serial killer, all kinds of um, unsolved mysteries out there, or as well as just what you think about the true crime world in general. But if you would like to hear what the um, podcast for sleep is like, I will include a link. I did one episode here on Black Box Online Radio, and there are some episodes already out on Astro Psych 400. I'm hoping there will be a new one out this weekend. And the absolute best way that you can help this channel is just by listening to some more content. That's it. That's all you got to do. Listen. It's free. And that's pretty much about it. You can, of course, do some things like go over to Amazon.com, have a look at my book, Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned DeHaan. It is a novel murder mystery inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is a fictional story. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to have a look at some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. But I kid thee not. There are things that you can do that cost you much less than that, such as just having a look at some of the other episodes. There are now over 1,000 episodes of Black Box Online Radio. If you count the days with the black box and the pink bubbles... Uh, I had a good time learning about that stuff and talking to you guys about all those cases. So I wanted to do this week's episode in a different way. Firstly, I was contacted by Mike Rodelli, who has contributed a lot to this program. Mike Rodelli is the author of the book In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, as well as his ebook, The Hunt for Zodiac. He has a particular Zodiac suspect named Shel Cavale, who stands out from the crowd I believe, for a couple of reasons. The first is Shulkavale was a Norwegian-American born in 1919, and he was also a very prominent and successful businessman. And those are just a few characteristics that I think are quite different than some of the other suspects. For example, some people would be proposing suspects who are maybe in their early 20s, who did not have a lot of formal education, and Rodelli would be on the opposite end of the spectrum. But there was a particular piece of news that came out, which I responded to one of the True Crime Talk radio segments, and that was about how 
there could be a new DNA breakthrough in the Zodiac Killer mystery, and that might reveal who committed the murders in 1968 and 69 that have been attributed to the Zodiac Killer, and also who wrote the letters, who wrote the ciphers, what is the answer? But you can see from the title of this episode, do they even have the Zodiac Killer's DNA? Mike Rodelli has authored a piece for this program, and he has uh, also done this in the past. You can hear um, Mike Rodelli's um, essay for sp specifically for Black Box Online Radio in the episode Zodiac Shell Cavale AMA. Again, that's the best way you can help this channel. Just listen to some more content, inviting you t to uh, check out any of the episodes. But he also created something for this episode to respond to the question, do they have the Zodiac Killer's DNA? And I want to be very clear that I'm going to be reading the words of Mike Rodelli. Everything that has been composed for this episode is from him, and this is his creation. So, firstly, let's say that on December 20th of 2001, Tom Voigt released some new information about DNA in the Zodiac Killer mystery. The source of this information is unknown, so we do not know how many Zodiac letters the testing involved. The information he provided is that after some 20 years of research, the only thing law enforcement has to show for its analysis of the Zodiac letters for DNA is that the DNA does not belong to the killer. While the news may have been disappointing to some, it could have easily been predicted based on my own research into these letters beginning in late 2002, and it is a sad commentary on the current state of affairs. In fact, the inability of law enforcement to isolate any DNA from the Zodiac letter writer was hardly a surprise if you've been following the science related to these letters. I decided that the time is now for me to write this exhaustive summary of the status of DNA as I am capable of writing given my position as a non-insider to the research being done by law enforcement. But nevertheless, as someone with a huge stake in the hunt for DNA from the killer, and in some ways as a victim of that thus far fruitless search, this will necessarily be a long and wide-ranging expose that will cover such topics as the difference between a working hypothesis and a proven experimental fact, the veil of secrecy of law enforcement, and how it has been erected around de research into DNA since the early 2000s, and how that secrecy has penetrated on several lev occasions over the years. The crucial issue of, of Zodiac licking his stamps and envelopes, or using a sponge and tap water to apply the stamps and seal his envelopes, and the likely best hope for obtaining DNA that may help solve the case. And, all right, here's an interjection on my part. I think you guys understand what Rodelli's talking about, but you must have seen that one program that talked about how they believe that the Zodiac Killer may have licked the envelopes and the stamps back in 1969, because you also had to lick stamps. We don't even have to do that now. Envelopes still, yes. But some people did not even like the taste of that stuff, so what they would do is they would use a sponge and tap water and apply it on there. But what they said in... Um, that now famous documentary is that the killer wouldn't have been afraid of leaving saliva and DNA behind because the science around DNA wasn't really established at the time. No one would be afraid to leave saliva DNA on an envelope or a stamp. So I think that's pretty clear. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. And that's, that's, a, that's another point that Rodelli brings up. How could anyone say with certainty that the killer even licked the stamps in the envelope, and th there are all kinds of alternative theories out there, which I'm sure you're already thinking about, but I don't think we need to go down that rabbit hole just yet. Okay, back to the essay. The discussion of DNA in the Zodiac case begins in the 1960s, long before the concept of DNA testing as a tool for solving crimes came into being. Zodiac had letters he wished to send to three local newspapers, the Vallejo Times-Herald, the San Francisco Examiner, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Let's start with the letters to the Examiner and the Chronicle. On both of those letters, the Zodiac used a 2-6 cent Franklin D. Roosevelt stamp pair. That's uh, two stamps. Six cents was the postage for a first-class letter in July of 1969. Therefore, on these two letters, Zodiac used double postage. On the final letter, 
the one that was sent to the Vallejo Times Herald, the Zodiac used four stamps. The important thing I want the reader to notice at this point is that if you look closely at the three envelopes, you can see that on all of them, the perforations of these stamps are still intact. That will have implications for the analysis of these letters for DNA and for determining the likely original source of the stamps. I was a preteen in the 1960s, and whenever I sent out a letter, I licked a stamp and I licked the flap of the envelope. I did it without thinking about it and without, as far as I can recall, complaining about the taste of glue. It was just something you had to do in those days, and I'm certain that most people didn't give it a second thought. Had I given any thought, I would have likely found out that in an office setting, for people who dislike the taste of glue on the envelope and the stamps, there was another option. That option was to use little round sponges and a glass container that had water in it. You could use the sponge to get it wet with water and use it to activate the glue of the stamps and wet the seal of the envelope. I seriously doubt that many middle-class families like my own use this method, although that is just a guess. However, in a busy office, if you dislike the taste of glue that it left in your mouth, or if you considered licking a stamp to be below your situation, using a sponge was an option. Another interjection here. Are, are you guys familiar with this? Like, for me, I actually like the taste of envelope glue. And I think you guys are all aware now. We don't need to lick stamps. I mean, you can just stick them on the envelope. But I like the taste of envelope glue. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't go out and get, like, ice cream of that flavor if it existed. But it doesn't bother me at all. I have one family member who absolutely does not lick envelopes and he saw me doing it. he was like no 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 don't do that i'll get you some water and i was like i don't mind i mean it it doesn't bother me but some people are absolutely repulsed by that taste right i think you can get the idea and you can just use that as a personal challenge question can, can do you like the envelope yourself or do you use the water what is a uh, common for you i mean just what do you think about that but a big question is if some people used the sponge and water, and some people actually licked the envelopes, what did the Zodiac do? And that's how Rodelli's introducing the next section. So which option did Zodiac use? Based on the fact that there is no conceivable way in which the Zodiac could have predicted the advent of DNA technology, my working hypothesis, prior to the actual scientific testing of the Zodiac letters, what they would not have been licked, and his stamps and envelopes, therefore left his DNA on the letters. There was, after all, little to no reason to think otherwise. And um, I think it means that there's no way to know that DNA was going to be such a big thing and they would actually be able to trace the killer to the letters. The Zodiac couldn't have predicted to it, and it's quite possible the real killer did lick the letters. So what is a working hypothesis? It is a preliminary conclusion that you draw prior to doing the requisite research to see if that conclusion is later borne out by the actual evidence. If this testing of your hypothesis by the accumulation of empirical evidence proves that your conclusion is correct, then you have confirmed your working hypothesis. However, if the data you collect proves otherwise, you either have to disregard your working hypothesis or change it in favor of a new hypothesis that explains the observed facts. That is the basis of hypothesis testing. Let's say that you're thinking about the salt content of seawater, and based on the given thought of the problem, that seawater likely has a salinity of 65 parts per thousand sodium chloride, then you undertake a worldwide sampling regimen testing many thousands of samples of seawater from oceans all around the world and determine that the actual scientific testing reveals a salinity of 35 parts per thousand. Well, what do you do? Well, what you don't do is pound your fist on the table and demand that the actual number is 65, as your working hypothesis stated. You must revise your working hypothesis, and now correctly state that seawater actually has salinity of 35 parts per thousand. You do not dogmatically attempt to make the empirical data fit your original working hypothesis. How does this apply to the Zodiac case? Let's see what happened to my working hypothesis, namely that because it was in the 1960s and DNA testing was a concept far in the future, let's say the Zodiac had in fact licked his stamps and envelopes. How will this hypothesis fare when it is put up against actual data obtained from the letters? 
In short, did the Zodiac Killer actually lick his stamps and envelopes or not? The Zodiac Killer sent about 20 letters or so to the editor, mainly the San Francisco Chronicle, between 1969 and 1974. When these letters arrived, they were treated with ninhydrin, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, N-I-N-H-Y-D-R-I-N, ninhydrin, for fingerprints, and then presumably kept in a binder for handwriting analysis by question documents experts. It is unknown how many times these letters would have been removed from their protective coverings and handled or shown around as some type of trophy evidence. In short, curious people wanted to see these letters, and I am sure that countless people who are wondering through SFPD wanted to see or maybe even touch those letters. How much were they handled? That cannot likely be quantified. But make no mistake that outside the surfaces of these letters, including the stamps, they would be subject to external contamination with DNA from people spraying saliva when they spoke, wetting their fingers before touching the letters, or sneezing or coughing on them. This includes the QD experts. And just as Zodiac would have had no idea about the coming of DNA testing, after his crime spree, neither did the police or the QD experts have any inkling that their saliva could contaminate the Zodiac letters. Since in the 1960s and 70s and into some of the 80s, none of them had any clue that these letters would eventually be tested for anything other than handwriting. And um, I also need to throw in the introduction that that thing about how DNA wasn't a big thing in the 1960s, they also weren't able to have the side palm print tested also called writer's palm, like instead of pressing your palm flat against a surface, it's the side of the palm that would be pressed in the places where the letter writer would have written the letter. And when I was discussing this with Tom Foyt once, he informed me that the writer's palm was only lifted from the 1974 exorcist letter, which the authorities do believe is a genuine communication. And this was important because it's part of the reason why they say Ar Arthur Lee Allen was exonerated. They're saying, number one, his DNA did not match. Number two, his side palm print did not match his uh, the writer's palm. So everything there in terms of forensic material was moving away from Arthur Lee Allen. That was just perhaps the most famous way that we all learned about this. I mean, by we, I mean somebody like me just watching the documentaries and such. Mike Rodelli, of course, learned about this as being an on-the-ground researcher from the beginning. So in the binder, the letter sat at the SFPD, and time slowly passed away. Then in 1986, DNA testing was discovered, and by the 1990s, DNA techniques had matured to the point where science was ready to try and use DNA that the killer had presumably placed on the letters. When he licked the stamps on the envelopes and sealed the envelopes, which, as you recall, is my working hypothesis, but let's fast forward now to 1998 in the SFPD's forensic lab and do some hypothesis testing on the notion that the Zodiac casually licked stamps and envelopes and in the 1960s, unaware of the coming DNA testing some 20 years into the future. In 1998, SFPD's lab was headed by a man named Alan Keel. Keel was the person who began the hunt for DNA on the Zodiac's letters. The first thing that Keel wisely decided to do was to establish that the Zodiac had in fact licked his stamps and envelopes, and in doing so placed his DNA bearing oral epithelial cells on the letters. Keel tested the letters for the presence of saliva. He did so by using a salivary enzyme called amylase, amylase as a marker for human saliva and the testing of its presence. The presence of amylase was tantamount to the presence of saliva, and therefore the DNA containing cells that are contained in human saliva. The more amylase, the more saliva, and the greater number of DNA bearing cells. But before we look at the results Keel obtained, let's take a quick look at how he generated these samples. There are two ways to analyze a stamp. The first is the one used by Keel, and I learned that that is the standard technique that all forensic labs apparently use to analyze stamps for saliva and DNA. What Keel did was to cut out a small piece of the stamp along with the attached via the glue on the underside of the stamp and the underlying part of the envelope and immerse the entire piece of the stamp, both the side attached to the envelope and the side that had been protected from external contamination as well as the outside of the stamp and the part that had been exposed to the outside environment and all potential contaminants and then extracting the solution. This technique will obviously extract saliva and amylase 
from both the protected side of the stamp and the unprotected side that was exposed to the environment. I think you guys could follow along with that. One side of the stamp is pressed down and it is not exposed, and the other side is exposed and faces outward. But as we will see, this is usually not a problem. The alternative technique is to peel back the stamp from the underlying envelope and carefully swab just the side the sender would have licked. Then immerse the cotton swab into the extracting solution. This was not the technique Keel used in his initial analyses. So what were the results of this exercise? Keel found that on the true zodiac letters, there was so little amylase activity from the stamps that he felt it would be unfair to say that they had been applied using a sponge soaked in tap water. In contrast, he said that there were two letters, one being the April 1978 letter, and the other one was one of the 1974 letters, which he did not specify, that apparently had been licked by the sender who was determined through research not to have been the Zodiac letter writer. These letters have had abundant DNA-containing cells and high levels of amylase activity, i.e. saliva. In fact, Kiel said that SFPD's lab actually segregates the two letters into groups. The true Zodiac letters, which are characterized by apparently not having been licked by the sender, which therefore are deficient in amylase and DNA-containing cells, and the two forgeries, which are characterized by high levels of amylase activity and generous numbers of DNA-laden oral epithelial cells. Getting back to my working hypothesis that the Zodiac had, in fact, licked the stamps and the envelope flaps, as you can see, the actual testing of the letters has now shot down my theory. So I now discard it and conform my new hypothesis to the empirical evidence and say that for whatever reason you wish to ascribe it, the Zodiac did not lick his stamps and envelopes. That is not something that simply helps me in my research into my suspect. That is reality based on science. The problem I see all the time on amateur discussion boards is that people take the working hypothesis that Zodiac would not have known about the coming DNA technology for years and therefore had no reason not to lick his stamps and envelopes. And that turned into a dogma for which they cannot be moved by empirical testing. Um, and to throw in some first-hand connection, while I'm hardly in the same ballpark of research as Mike Rodelli, I definitely learned about this stuff the same way that most people in those forum communities is. There was a very famous documentary that was talking about this, and it was the one that um, talked about exonerating Arthur Lee Allen, as well as, I mean, it just made sense to the general public standpoint when I know that's not the best thing to do in the true crime world, but in the 1960s, well, they didn't have DNA testing, so people wouldn't be afraid of DNA testing. I mean, you could follow that in a logical sequence. And I don't, I'm not disputing this with Mike Rodelli. Absolutely not. I'm simply stating that, yes, I fell into that whole amateur discussion category of, well, I follow what you're saying, at least. But, I mean, it's just that. He had no reason not to lick his stamps and envelopes and that turned into a dogma from which they cannot be moved by empirical testing data. They believe that Zodiac licked his stamps and envelopes, and nobody can convince them otherwise. This sheer level of ignorance of scientific methodology is difficult for me to understand and accept. You can prove through solid physical evidence that the Zodiac did not lick his stamps and envelopes, and yet time and time again I am confronted with comments on message boards, insisting that he did lick them because there's no way to say that he didn't do so. Well, that's not an effective method because that's just proving a negative, and um, it's, you're going to violate some type of law of logic at a certain point. Oh yeah, we'll prove that he didn't. No, the burden of proof is on the person who is making the claim. And then people have to respond to you. The plain fact is that the Zodiac did not lick his stamps and envelopes for the reason that only he knew and anyone believes otherwise, and anyone who says something to the contrary is frankly kidding himself or herself. So, now, why would somebody not lick the envelopes? One reason, as we said, they don't like the taste of stamps and glue. Some people are indeed repulsed by it. Others would be that maybe if Rodelli is right, then the Zodiac is some type of affluent business person, that this was something that was more formal to use the water in the jar, and, and maybe there's a certain prestige, like those people who open their envelopes with letter openers. You don't need to do that, but some people still do it all the same. In about 2000, Tom Voigt published a chart detailing the number of cells found on various Zodiac letters. The result ranged 
from few cells found to cells found. So why don't we have a viable sample of Zodiac's DNA using the amplification system known as PCR on these cells? The answer lies in the technique Keel used in the late 1990s to obtain the cells and to create the chart, namely by cutting out a piece of the stamp front and back and immersing it in the extraction fluid. This technique has the drawback of not being able to discriminate between cells from the glue on the side of a stamp that came from a person licking it and contaminant cells from the front of the stamp. Therefore, any cells may be nothing more than contaminant cells from the outside of the stamp. Conversely, there is no proof that any of the cells that Alan Keel found came from the sender of the Zodiac letters. And throwing in something else, I am also the host of the Zodiac Killer Channel's Interview with the Experts series, and I have interviewed Mike Rodelli, and he also talked about another very famous um, video clip of someone who was trying to extract um, forensic material from some items after the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. And he was talking about how the woman, or I believe it's a woman, the person is wearing a mask, but the mask was beneath their nose. And now in 2022, we are very much aware about wearing masks and the um, exporting of micro droplets and that if the mask isn't completely over your nose and such, then you can still breathe on it. And the person could have been contaminating the evidence at that point. And this is what they tell you about DNA. Again, I am not a scientist. I am not a researcher who's been following this for 20 years like some of these guys. But what they tell you about DNA in the true crime world is if you even spend five minutes in a room breathing, you're going to leave DNA behind. Because of just that, you're exporting micro droplets and in your breath there's going to be these very little small particles that you can't see and they're going to go places so if someone is hovering over a piece of paper or a piece of the victim's clothing and they're breathing on it then it's going to be contaminated that part i can follow but and if anybody would like to um, weigh in on this discussion, just simply based on what you've heard from Rodelli in his essay, um, you can write your responses on the comment section down below. And as Mike Rodelli said very clearly, it's not simply about just choosing a hypothesis and demanding that your hypothesis is correct. He is definitely putting out his um, material because he wants to be challenged. So please feel free to weigh in in the comment section down below. In 2018, I was fortunate enough to speak with Debbie McKillop, who works as a scientist in the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office Forensic Lab. She explained to me that the technique Alan Keel used of cutting out pieces of the stamp and analyzing them for cells and DNA, which is the standard technique used by labs to analyze for genetic material, works fine as long as the stamps were licked by the sender. The reason for this, she explained, is that the sender licked the stamp. The amount of saliva, cells, and DNA they placed on the glue of the stamp would frankly overwhelm any small contaminant DNA on the outside of the stamp. And it is only the DNA of the person who licked the stamp. Therefore, once Keel saw that there was very little amylase activity from the stamps on the Zodiac letters and a few DNA cells in his samples, he should have switched techniques by peeling back the stamp and then swabbing the glue side of the stamps. That the side that is not exposed, as we called it before, instead of using the standard technique of cutting out the pieces, what eventually did, what he eventually did, I do not know. But there is a chance that he could have debated between techniques. However, it is not completely possible to determine someone's thought process. I mean, I do have to say something else but to you guys. This is stuff that you do hear on message boards, reading it rather, but they point out that there should be more DNA from the person who was licking the stamps or even like a large piece of touch DNA, even if it's touch DNA from around the stamp, because no matter what, someone is going to be pressing the stamp down, even if they didn't put their saliva on it. Again, that's going to leave DNA behind. And even to someone who is not a scientist, I would just think that there would be a larger amount of um, cells that are present. And but maybe this scientist is a real scientist, unlike me, and she knows exactly what she's talking about and said, well, yeah, they can easily differentiate it. Yeah, if someone pressed their hand down on this, 
then there's going to be a larger amount of cells, or they use their saliva, or maybe they can differentiate it some ways, or maybe Rodelli is correct, and that the technique that was used was inappropriate. There simply wasn't an overwhelming mass of cells, so they should have done something differently. Um, seems like there is still somewhat of a mystery. Getting back to the chart and the results that Kiel created and Tom Voigt posted in 2000 or 2001, since there were generally few cells found in his analyses, and since his technique extracted cells from both the front and the glue side of the stamp, given how difficult it is and how subsequently proven to how difficult it is to prove that the cells were isolated, the letter writer's DNA from the zodiac letters, I believe that it is possible that the cells Kiel did isolate from such letters as the July twenty fourth, nineteen seventy letter, which is the John's letter, and the July twenty sixth letter, the little list letter may have come exclusively from the front of the stamps, with no cells at all isolated from the glue side. Therefore, Kiel's chart is useless in evaluating the letters. If any of the cells on the glue side of the stamp that came from the actual letter writer, since there is no proof at all that the cells were from the outside of these letters, the next time we heard about the letters being analyzed for DNA was on the October 2002 ABC primetime news show. In about April of 2001, I was approached by Harry Phillips, a producer at ABC. He told me that my work on the Zodiac case was incredible, and he felt that I was on to something important. So I decided to work exclusively with ABC towards solving the Zodiac case and proving that my suspect, Shel Cavale, was the Zodiac killer. The show turned out to be slow going. By September of 2001, nothing much happened. Then... 9-11 hit, and everything came to a standstill until next year. In April of 2002, ABC News came to my home in New Jersey and interviewed me about the case, and then I waited. In the summer of 2002, Phillips told me that he would be working with SFPD's forensic lab, which apparently did not have enough funds or time to analyze the most important evidence in their possession to develop a DNA profile from the Zodiac letters. In order to do so, ABC provided the funding for the lab, Dr. Sidney Holt, to devote nights and weekends to the task of finding DNA. The results turned out to be a disaster, although nobody knew that until 2018 when a whistleblower provided the intimate details of what actually happened in the lab. In October of 2002, ABC was finally ready to go on air. When the show came on, ABC said the SFPD's lab had developed a sample of what was presumed by the show and the way it was presented on the show to be the Zodiac's DNA from one of the letters. This DNA was compared to three suspects, one of whom was Arthur Lee Allen, one of whom was my own suspect, Shel Cavale, and it did not match any of them. Since DNA was then considered infallible and the absolute final arbiter of the guilt or innocence of any suspect, and my suspect was a non-match, I was shot down on national TV. This immediately destroyed my credibility for many years. The next day I was told by Harry Phillips to write a letter of apology to my suspect through ABC and hope he didn't sue me. So I did. The worst part is that I heard that my suspect had actually volunteered a DNA sample for comparison. Surely I was told by other amateurs eager for the demise of my own research that the fact that he had volunteered a sample of his DNA was absolute proof in or of itself that he had nothing to do with this and he was innocent. Stunned by everything that happened, given that Phillips had originally told me in 2001 that he felt I was on to something, I tended to agree. Okay, something to, for you guys. I was talking about this in the Shel Cavale AMA when somebody wrote in a comment saying, one reason why Shel Cavale should not be thought of as the Zodiac Killer is, he, he volunteered a DNA sample. He openly gave it up. How could he be certain that he left no DNA behind? Because, let's say, for example, this guy, Shel Cavale, who should have no connection to the Zodiac letters, had his DNA turned up on the stamp or something, well, then he would look pretty guilty. And Shel Cavale was still alive in 2001 and 2002. He could have been facing jail time. Even if there was something else going on, like how could the killer know that he did not leave DNA behind? Now, you also might be thinking that um, some explanations might be turning in your head right now. You'd be like, Oh, well, he would just make up some story. Hey, it's false. It was planted there. Or maybe he was expecting that there's no way they actually have the DNA. Or 
Maybe Rodelli is onto something when he says that the killer could have known that he didn't lick the stamps because he never licks stamps. It's like, yeah, I never licked the stamp. These people don't know what they're talking about. Take all the DNA you want. But that still wouldn't um, exclude him from things in the future because I think someone as intelligent as Shel Cavale was would probably know that DNA testing is going to become much bigger. And as I said, it's not only about licking a stamp, but just breathing on something for five minutes should leave behind some DNA. Immediately after the DNA elimination of Arthur Lee Allen and my suspect Shel Cavale, the apologists on Tom Voigt's message boards were typing at full speed to keep Allen as a suspect while ditching mine. Well, oh, there's some truth to that. People definitely don't like to steer away from Arthur Lee Allen. First, they said that everyone, except apparently me, knew that Allen was absolutely hated. Abso Allen absolutely hated the taste of glue on a stamp and would never have lowered himself to lick one. He in either, either had one of the neighborhood kids that allegedly swarmed around his house in Vallejo on their bicycles like them, or maybe his dog did the dirty work for him. What? I mean, I've had I definitely had a dog, and I've asked my dog to do um, some things. Hey, go get the newspaper, and the dog didn't do it. You're going to get your dog to lick a stamp? Um, I don't know if that's very plausible. But um, people yeah, definitely don't want to give up Arthur Lee Allen is a suspect, and we can do a whole episode on that. Why are people so strong to cling to Alan as a suspect? I think that some of it is they just simply learned about it from Robert Graysmith and the Fincher film, and they think that he is a very compelling suspect, and they don't want to um, do anything other than that. Like, you, the first one that they learned about, they just want to hold on to their guns and such. Because if it's just about the DNA, well, I mean, Shel Cavalli would be dismissed so quickly and staying to Alan. I follow what Rodelli is saying, but this thing about not liking the taste of glue. I told you I knew someone who was exactly like that. I mean, that's just the most vivid example. Some people simply do not lick their stamps because they hate the taste of glue. So they use the water, they have other people do it. Absolutely. And um, for the record, if my DNA ever turns up on any type of envelope on a crime that I had nothing to do with, I also hate the taste of glue. Disregard everything that I said before. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, same story as Alan. But the kids would um, sometimes lick the DNA for Alan, and the ABC DNA was not good enough to eliminate Alan, but it was good enough to eliminate my wealthy suspect, since he was not a good suspect to begin with. I guess these posters somehow knew that my suspect, in contrast to Arthur Lee Allen, must have relished the licking, have relished licking the offensive tasting stamps and the envelope flaps. The police at about this time began chanting the mantra that only the DNA can solve the Zodiac case. It apparently was beyond the investigative abilities of SFPD and other agencies to solve the Zodiac mystery using traditional means. They apparently weren't aware of the fact that prior to the advent of DNA, cases had been successfully solved in courtrooms for hundreds of years. So now that there finally was DNA in the case, the public would just have to wait for a match in, the, in order to learn the killer's identity. The police then erected a wall of silence around any DNA research, and that still exists to this day. Lyndon Lafferty, a longtime Zodiac researcher and former California Highway Patrolman, said that he had decided to call the SFPD the day after the ABC show aired. He spoke directly to the homicide inspector, Mike Maloney, who was one of the pair of detectives working on the Zodiac case at the time. He discussed the new DNA that had just been presented on the ABC show with Maloney. Maloney told Lafferty that, out of the blue, that the DNA from the show was taken in a premature way, taken aback by his statement about DNA that had just been used to rule out three suspects on national television, I'm sure wanting to get his own suspect compared in the DNA post haste, Lafferty says, does this mean that it's invalid? Maloney paused to consider the implications and said yes. So the DNA has just been used to demolish my credibility on national television before a nationwide audience, but suddenly it's invalid? What was that about? While we would get some information to trickle out of SFPD over the next 16 years, a full accounting of the true nature of the 2002 Zodiac DNA, or ZNA as it has been called, would have to wait until January 2016 when a whistleblower made a statement from within the department. The ABC show was not aired in Europe, therefore I had to send my copy of the show on a VHS 
to my friend and colleague, Edward Vers Louis, in the Netherlands. Edward, who had recently worked in a DNA lab, was eager to see the show. After watching it, Edward was the least to say that he was shocked at what he saw. Dr. Sidney Holt, the lab director for the SFPD, made mistakes in her job at the lab, and Edward said, even a first-year lab technician would not have made. She did not tie her long hair back. She rested her sleeves of her lab coat on the workbench, thus potentially causing contaminants to get from her sleeves onto the surface, and the most glaring error was handling the envelope. In the instance that she had gloves on and used those gloves to handle the open evidence of the envelope, she then reached into the envelope using the same pair of gloves and fetched the Zodiac envelope itself in using the same gloves to handle both the outside of the envelope and the Zodiac envelope it contained. She risked transferring contaminant DNA from the evidence envelope to the Zodiac letter. See, I never would have thought about that because I'm not a forensic scientist, that you have to wear a different pair of gloves for the outside of the envelope and a different pair of gloves for the inside of the envelope. If contaminant female DNA from an unknown source were later to be found on the Zodiac evidence, one might have to look no further than Dr. Holt as the source of the contamination. Since the 2021 DNA from someone other than the Zodiac is said to be any lead, it may be from Dr. Holt, but I'll believe that it is a lead and not a dead end when it actually becomes one. So for the 2002 Zodiac DNA, that was off to a bad start with respect to its viability as evidence that could exclude a suspect, but the news would get worse in 2009. In 2009, a lady named Debbie Perez came along and told her story about accompanying her stepfather, Guy Ward Hendrickson, from Southern California to the Bay Area to commit the Zodiac crimes. She had in tow a former attorney from the Melvin Bellay Law Firm to lend credence to her story, which was included in the fact that the reason the Zodiac's handwriting was described as being childish is because she, Debbie Perez, had actually written some of the letters herself. She had held a news conference on the steps of the San Francisco Chronicle, where the Zodiac had sent the bulk of his letters for added effect. A crowd of newspeople and onlookers surrounded her as she spoke. A day before the story broke, I received an email from someone who was eager to rub the Perez story in my face. This person absolutely assured me that Perez was definitely going to prove her story, and be the actual solution to the Zodiac case. What is wrong with people? How could anyone ever believe something like that? I mean, why? Just because someone's holding a press conference, it doesn't mean they're telling the truth. There are lots of liars out there. But then it all started, suddenly started to blow up before our eyes. First of all, it was revealed that Perez had previously claimed that she was allegedly the love child of likely eye roll, including JFK. It's my favorite sentence in this whole uh, thing, by the way. Yes, but um, Debbie Perez did also say she was the illegitimate child of John F. Kennedy. Her attorney from the prestigious Bell Life firm had apparently been disbarred. And, um, oh, but uh, the Zodiac, though, did want to talk to two lawyers, right? One was Melvin Belli, and the other was F. Lee Bailey, who was perhaps more famous for being an attorney in the O.J. Simpson case. And he also went on to become disbarred. So, not important, just throwing that in there. She said that she had Paul Stein's missing eyeglasses and that de demanded that her DNA be compared to the DNA from the ABC show since she had written some of the letters. Even though the DNA recovered for the ABC show was clearly said to have come from a male contributor, right? You know, I mean, if you're going to try and convince me that Debbie Perez was um, a fraud, you don't really need to do too much. And we can talk more about her suspect, Guy Ward Hendrickson, in the future, but... What I just don't get with these things is, why do people latch on to a story like that so easily? I mean, just because somebody is saying this, it doesn't mean that people tell the truth all the time, or they can provide an explanation. It doesn't mean that their explanation is accurate. There are people who do nothing else with their lives, other than think of good ways to lie. Behind the scenes of the slow motion disaster, I was at work with the Chronicle reporter Kevin Fagan, and that is because, in response to Perez's demand for DNA to the 2002 Zodiac DNA, SFPD stated that the 2002 DNA may not be reliable for eliminating suspects. I pounced when I heard this and asked Fagan to push his F SFPD sources for more info. In response, Fagan told me that his source said that the lab had mixed up samples and messed them up. Yet another strike against the 2002 DNA. How could you eliminate a suspect 
such as my own, against DNA that wasn't reliable. It would take another nine years for the whistleblower to come forward. In December seven, in December of 2017, my ebook, The Hunt for Zodiac, The Inconceivable Double Life of a Notorious Zodiac Killer, came out the very next month, too. Late for me to include that information in my ebook was the unidentified whistleblower who had insider knowledge about the DNA had come forward. What they had to say was shocking, but not at all unpredictable. First, they said that, as of 2018, there was no Zodiac DNA, and there never had been any. They said that Dr. Holt had looked for DNA from the letter writer where it should have been, and that is on the glue side of the stamps, within the sealed flaps of the letters. She found none. This is confirmed at least to those who are paying attention to the science and were not deluded by any dogmatic belief that since the Zodiac had sent the letters before the DNA testing, had taken place that he must have licked the stamps. What Alan Keel had said to me ten years earlier about it being likely that the stamps were applied with a sponge and water, because that's exactly what it appears to have happened. Future glimpses behind the iron curtain of secrecy surrounding the Zodiac DNA research would only serve to solidify this belief. Instead of reporting back to ABC News that the big story is that the letter writer's DNA was not recoverable from the letters using the techniques available in 2002, such as PCR amplification, Dr. Holt took a different and disappointing route. Even with the advent of PCR, which would have given Dr. Holt the leeway to recover as few as 50 or so cells in 2002 and still get the DNA result, she couldn't muster that small numbers of cells and the backs of the stamps or the flaps from the envelopes actually had the letter writer's DNA. However, at least up to that point, she was doing well with science in limiting herself to the areas where she would have expected that the letter writer's DNA could be found. That is until she decided to give in to temptation and go over to the dark side, that being the outside of the stamp where the dreaded contaminant DNA resides. And were, the, were there three suspects eliminated on that ABC show against DNA that came from God only knows who? We will never know. My fear after hearing about all of this information was that the whistleblower in 2018 is that Dr. Holt may have felt in some way obligated to ABC to provide to the network at least some DNA that had come from somewhere on the Zodiac letter and use it for the show. Is this pressure to pay ABC News back for its financial investment in the DNA testing? Or is this a way to get the DNA testing to drive her to a sample on the outside of envelope and then turn a blind eye to how ABC would use the DNA on their show? We don't know. Worse, was there a quid pro quo of we'll give you the money to do the research and in return you give us some DNA to use? I fear that the answer to that question may be yes. When you are looking for the letter writer's DNA, specifically under the seal of an envelope, it has to be done in a certain way. Their DNA methods were pseudoscientific in 2002. After 2002, SFPD in particular tried to keep people from coming to them with new suspects and they closed the case in 2004, and it has uh, since been reopened. I believe that was 2007 or 8. In May of 2018, Vallejo Police Department announced that they were undertaking renewed testing of the Zodiac letters in their possession. However, many that may be, the haughtily promised results in the three months, and after three years, they still had not condensed anything to tell the public about any results, despite using the public's money. The recent DNA update on Tom Voigt's site may have come from them since they are the only department known to be actively doing DNA research, but Tom indicated that it did not. However, they may or may not have been accurate, and he may have said that in order to keep people from bothering VPD for additional information. Now let's discuss the source of the stamps the Zodiac used in the letters. In what format did he get them? In the 1960s, there was number one, the roll of Franklin D. Roosevelt stamps, number two, the sheet of stamps with a hundred or so of them, presumably for the office. Number three, and one other source that I had forgotten about completely until just a few days ago, the stamp booklet. As I said before, when we look at the Zodiac's first letter from July of 1969, we can see that on the Chronicle and Examiner letters, he used two six-cent stamps. On the Times-Herald letter, he used four six-cent stamps. If you look very closely at the envelopes, you can see once again that the perforations of these have not been broken. That clearly means that for the Times-Herald letter, at least, the Zodiac could not have used a roll of stamps since those would be solid in a single string of stamps, and you could not get four stamps attached in that manner. 
shown on the envelope from a roll. That leaves the flat sheet of 100 stamps and the stamp booklet as the two possibilities. I mean, did you guys follow all that, that if it was a roll of stamps, then they wouldn't be pressed together that way? If they were a flat booklet of stamps, then that things would be pressed together that way? The booklet contained both six-cent stamps and one-set stamps, totaling $2, and the outside of the booklet was also presented. One of these small sheets of six-cent stamps included was also there. The important thing to note is that the likely the sheet of stamps, it was possible to tear four adjacent stamps out of a booklet, so, which one did the Zodiac use, the sheet or the booklet? In my book, I propose that the, Zo the Exorcist letter was the second forged letter about which Alan Keel spoke about from 1974. I state this because Keel's chart of letters that was made public is the only one of the four canonical 1974 letters that has been analyzed. But here is some evidence that made me reconsider my opinion. The envelope from the Exorcist letter, noted in addition to the stamp, used included a zip code stamp, just like the ones found in the booklets. I presume that the one stating mail early in the day was yet another type of extraneous stamp, including in some of the booklets, and the printed labels that are also attached to the envelope refer to issues pertaining to the eight stamp booklets. Eight cents was the amount for first class postage in 1974. Zodiac seemed to be giving us a hint that he was using stamp booklets. Okay, now, somebody just referred to the Exorcist letter as a forgery. The Exorcist letter goes more or less, I saw and think the Exorcist was the best satirical comedy ever. P.S. Um, if I don't see this note in your paper, I'll do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of. There's a quote in there from the Mikado saying, um, he plunged into the billowy wave and something about the suicide's grave, titwillow, titwillow, titwillow. I know I read that kind of out of order, but I'm just going off of memory on that. And I openly asked um, Tom Voigt about this when we were talking about the uh, side palm print, the writer's palm. And he's like, hey, the only real writer's palm they have is from the 1974 Exorcist letter. And I said, wait a second, wait a second. The Exorcist letter came after the halt in Zodiac activity from 1971, 72, and 73. Really, it's 72 and 73. That's what they call the two-year halt in Zodiac activity. How do we truly know that the Exorcist letter was a genuine Zodiac communication? And the response that I got from Tom Voigt is, you have to always remember that the authorities have more evidence and information than they are sharing with the general public. So as of now, I accept that the Exorcist letter is a genuine communication. But I think that, let's just get back to Micro Deli's essay. If in the face of all this evidence you are still going to insist that I am making all of this up to further my own research and somehow excuse the fact that my suspect was eliminated against the 2002 DNA as having been the Zodiac Killer, you should ask yourself, the 1974 and 78 forgeries casually licked the stamps and the envelopes and they were able to use DNA even from Stone Age pre-PCR lab techniques. And the 74 letter Rodelli was just citing is not the Exorcist letter. And he, here we have some 20 years later, according to what has been told, police forensics labs still cannot isolate any DNA from the Zodiac letter, even when using the highly sensitive PCR techniques and presumably even touch DNA technology. My question to you is, if the Zodiac actually did lick his stamps and envelopes, then where the heck is the DNA and why has it been impossible to prove such far? The answer is not a difficult one if you just free your mind and think about it. And big thank you to Micro Deli for authoring this essay for Black Box Online Radio. But I had a follow-up question. Well, all right, Mike. If we are not going to be able to use DNA to solve the case, then what would you use? And Rodelli responded to me by saying, behavioral profiling. Creating a profile of someone who seems to match the consistent uh, trends and personality traits and then looking at how all of that would fit together. And Rodelli has one where he believes that the Zodiac Killer was a prominent businessman named Shulkavale. And a piece of evidence that he uses for this is not only the uh, concept of not licking the stamps and um, always using the first-class stamps, but also that the Zodiac only wrote on monarch-sized stationery. Not only wrote. There are, of course, even some unconfirmed things that could fit differently. I mean, the Zodiac builded cards, right? Like the Halloween card, for example. But the Zodiac wrote on monarch-sized stationery, which was very common in the elite circles, so says Rodelli. 
and that he also wants to put together different pieces of evidence. But what do you think about his suspect, Shul Cavale, who was um, a businessman very involved with the auto trade, the premier importer of Volkswagens on the West Coast, I believe, and he was also really into racing, horse racing, speedboat racing, um, and, of course, auto racing, I believe there's racing cars in Corona, California. Oh, and some things that Rep. Mike Rodelli did share with me during our interview on the Interviews with the Experts series is that Shul Cavale actually unofficially tied the record for the 100-meter dash when he was a runner. And my question was like, do you, does this guy just have a need for speed? Like, what is it with that? And it seems like, yeah, the answer is that Shul Cavale was a real speed junkie. He was into racing pretty much anything that he could get his hands on. And I believe Rodelli said in a previous essay that Shul Cavale even raced speedboats at Lake Berryessa, where the Zodiac committed the third uh, confirmed crime. But what do you think about his suspect? You can also weigh in on anyone else we've talked about. Arthur Lee Allen, Deb Perez, and maybe there's a suspect that you wanted to hear about. And you can always talk about, you know, did you know someone who doesn't really like the taste of glue? What do you think about all that? Please put your ideas in the comments section down below. Again, big thank you to Mike Rodelli for authoring this essay. And once I get a website, if I ever do get a website, I'm just going to have like a contributor side on the um, part of like the kind of sidebar where I can just show everyone and their con contributions to this channel. And then I could even have like a little list of the episodes where Mike Rodelli has written things. Because in addition to writing the Shel Cavale episode that I did once, Mike Rodelli um, wrote an essay about Lyndon Lafferty and his book, The Zodiac Killer Cover-Up, which I use in my two-part series responding to Lyndon Lafferty's book, The Zodiac Killer Cover-Up, also known as The Silence Badge. Because I didn't know Lyndon Lafferty. He has since passed away. But as you heard in the essay today, Mike Rodelli did indeed know Lyndon and you can hear all of his responses in that one. Many things on this channel. You can always like, subscribe, Astro Psych 400, and any of the other links in the description box. Okay, thank you so much, and until next time.